Ende 2008 wurde Bernhard Lorenz Madoff wegen Betrugs verhaftet, da er jahrzehntelang einen Investmentfonds nach einem Ponzi-Schema betrieben hatte. Der Gesamtumfang des Schadens wurde zum Zeitpunkt des Prozesses gegen Madoff auf mindestens 65 Milliarden Dollar veranschlagt, die Zahl der Geschädigten auf 4800. In dieser englischsprachigen Dokumentation kommen Geschädigte zu Wort, und du solltest aufpassen, was sie sagen, damit du nicht auf solchen Betrug reinfällst. Los geht's nach dem Intro. Americans are taking to the streets in anger. Give us the money back! At bankers for ruining the economy. At CEOs for taking bailout money as bonuses. At the stock market for demolishing their retirement plans. Into this arena waltzes public enemy number one. Mr. Madoff, what do you say? Financial fraudster Bernard Madoff, who gives a name and a face to all that went wrong and a focus for everyone's anger. America thought the boom would last forever. For the last 25 years, we've had this enormous boom throughout the world. There's never been anything remotely like that in the history of, of finance. But in 2008, America found itself at a crossroads. The stock market slide continued today. Wall Street's worst week ever. Moscow fell 14%. Japan's Nikkei dropping 9%. 18%. How low will it go? When the stock market collapsed, people all across the country took a hit. I can see myself working for 10 or 15 years longer than I might have uh, originally thought I would. Outraged Americans watched as more than $2.4 trillion of their savings vanished in a few weeks. My money is gone. My 40K, what I plan to live off on, is not there. An infuriated nation began to wonder, were the underpinnings that held the American economy together just smoke and mirrors? To make matters worse, the downturn brought to light an unprecedented amount of fraud. When the tide goes out in the financial markets, you can see who was overexposed, who was cutting corners, who was operating fraudulently. The biggest fraud of all was Bernard Madoff, who stole some $65 billion dollars perpetrating the largest Ponzi scheme in history. Mr. Madoff, what do you say? A nation up in arms found one focus for their fury. It's very hard for people to wrap their minds around the drop in this S&P 500 or the mortgage meltdown. He puts a face on what we've all been feeling the last few years. People who you know, had absolutely nothing to do with Bernie Madoff could look at this man and say, this is the human being who symbolizes the loss in my portfolio. He is someone people can focus their anger, their attention on, and it's going to be remembered as the Madoff era. No one was angrier than investors who lost everything. So angry that some started showing up at Madoff's front door demanding their money. Tell George Cates, George Cates wants to talk to him right now. Behavior, I'm call the police. Go ahead, call the police. I could care less. Call, call the police. You know what? You have a lot of class. All right, you got a lot of class, too. Okay. All right. I think that Bernie Madoff should go to jail for the rest of his life and pay for what he did. Norman Brayman, the 76-year-old former owner of the Philadelphia Eagles football team, had $32 million from his family foundation invested with Madoff. I'm shocked by it, uh, and, and I feel terrible. It's the scam of the century. Like most investors, he was introduced to Bernie Madoff by a friend. You practically had to have an embossed invitation testifying to your worthiness to invest in Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme. It was a privilege to invest with Bernard Madoff, which, of course, it would just catnip. He would do them a favor. That was a genius of marketing, wasn't it? He made it seem so exclusive that, no, no, you can't get in. Well, maybe you can get in. There were people that, that tried to, to place money with Madoff. 
that, that couldn't even place dollars with him. He wouldn't take them. You had to know somebody, a friend of a friend, who had some influence for Madoff to accept an account. I mean, this was a, a, a classic Ponzi scheme in every single way. The Ponzi scheme is a simple swindle, whereby one set of investors are paid unreal returns out of money received from another. The scheme is named after Carlo Ponzi, who perpetrated the fraud in Boston in 1920. Ponzi is a small-timer, shady, underground character. He arrives in the United States from Italy, already a convicted smuggler, forger, and vegetable peddler. He's a man from nowhere. Ponzi was offering to double people's money in 90 days, purportedly through stamps known as postage reply coupons. He would take stamps from one country and sell them in the United States for an enormous profit. It was preposterous. There weren't enough of these reply coupons to support a, a, a multi-million dollar investment venture. But it didn't matter. I mean, all he needed was the excuse, was the story. A good story? and a gift for Gab. Ponzi schemers tend to be charming. Ponzi's case, he, he was the guy you would put at the head of a parade. You would follow him anywhere. He had that charisma. When I met a Ponzi artist, the first thing I thought was, wow, I like him. He's so nice. His eyes are bringing me in. I feel it. He's like a magnet. That magnetism is essential to keeping all Ponzi scams going. The key to perpetuating the Ponzi scheme is to keep attracting new levels of investors. Carlo Ponzi started out with just 10 people, and then it was 100 people, and then it was 1,000, and then it was 20,000, all in the course of about six months. Ponzi's scheme coincided perfectly with the beginning of an enormous stock market bubble in America. Ponzi is one of a long line of people in the 1920s who take advantage of this sense of exhilaration, a sense that the economy is booming and will boom continually. He rode that wave, and he knew that the people out there believed that others were getting rich quick, right next door. Why couldn't we have a piece of that action? Ponzi and Madoff have tremendous amount in common. These are two men who recognized what people wanted, and they found a way to satisfy it. Bernie Madoff was making people an offer they couldn't refuse. Steady 1% gains every month, 10 to 12% a year, despite market volatility. Bernie Madoff was promising his investors really the holy grail, constant, steady, excellent returns. And that is the thing that investors today want as much as anything, security, stability. That, you know, if somebody is promising them double or triple their money, they're gonna be doubtful. He was promising that, don't worry, whatever you give me will grow and grow and grow. And that was so seductive to people. My family, unfortunately, had all of their money with Bernie Madoff. I was as surprised that Bernie Madoff had been arrested as I was when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Retired stockbroker Joyce Greenberg's father began investing with Madoff in the 1970s. I did not feel that Madoff's 10% was unreasonable. If it had been 20% um, or 15%, I would definitely have been suspicious, but not at 10%. Greenberg's family had heard about the opportunity through an early Madoff investor, a typical example of the power of social feedback. People are making money, they tell other people about it, that makes it safe, that makes it attractive, then people put money in. So the social feedback loop is very important. Social feedback loop, a fancy term for word of mouth, helps explain the herd mentality behind all investor manias, even ones that are not fraudulent, like the Dutch tulip mania. In 1636, speculators drove the price of tulip bulbs to six times the average annual salary, even buying shares in a single bulb. More recently in the 1990s, word of mouth about new dot-com companies drove stock prices to stratospheric highs. To investors in the loop, all these opportunities look too good to pass up. That's part of the human psychology here. There's one side of our brain that says, this is too good to be true. And the other side says, this is too good to miss. I think the most shocking thing about it is that, you know, people say, well, that's what you get, you know, if you're into get-rich-quick schemes. This was not a get-rich-quick scheme. This was an investment um, tool. Palm Beach resident Susan Markin saw these returns as a conservative investment. 
when people were making 18% return on their money, Madoff was only making, say, 10 or 9. So he was a steady performer from most people that looked at it. Clients saw the funds that were feeding money into Madoff as the safest part of their portfolio. Believe it or not, there is a tremendous climate of trust on Wall Street. You are trusting the people you do deals with all the time. You're trusting they're going to execute their part of the trade, that they're not going to steal your money. It's that basic, normal confidence that the confidence man abuses. Investors thought Bernard Madoff was earning big money for them, but the government said he made off with billions he stole from them. Someone called me up and said, turn on your television. And so I did, and I was shocked. I felt sick to my stomach, actually. Like any investment firm, Madoff produced monthly statements. It looked as though he was buying and selling blue chip stocks like Procter & Gamble, American Express, and Exxon. I kept track of the buys and sells and the monthly statements and the quarterly investment reports, and we received 1099s at the end of the year. There was nothing that would arouse my suspicion. It looked very diversified. It looked very liquid. It looked tailored to your own personal account. My level of understanding was very high, except for one thing. I did not realize until after Bernard Madoff was arrested that apparently he had been writing fiction. Complete and utter fiction. In court, Madoff admitted he never bought or sold a single share of stock. He simply deposited investors' money in his bank account. What do you think should happen to him? I can't say it on the camera. <laughs> Financial fraud like the Madoff scandal can bring out trepidation in the public. Running through American culture is a very basic ambivalence about Wall Street, a kind of love hate relationship. On the one hand, when times are good, it nurtures that desire in, in Americans to grow rich and seems to deliver on the American dream. But it's also colored by the opposite reaction, hatred for the street, a hatred for an institution of people who take advantage of other people, who become themselves super rich, who scheme and defraud and live off the hard work of others. We learn about these guys in times of recession. They show up when the economy turns. Madoff was not the only fraud to show up. In early 2009, practically every week, another scandal surfaced. Richard Piccoli, charged with stealing $17 million. Arthur Nadell disappeared with $300 million. Joseph Forte, charged with running a $50 million Ponzi. Nicholas Cosmo allegedly absconded with $130 million. Paul Greenwood and Stephen Walsh purportedly defrauded investors out of $554 million. Alan Stanford, charged by the Securities and Exchange Commission with conducting an $8 billion Ponzi scheme. Financial fraud is not new to Wall Street. Speculative scams ran rampant during the 1920s stock market boom. In the 1920s, there are investment pools. These investment pools are run by the most powerful people in America. Walter Chrysler, Charles Schwab of U.S. Steel, William Crapo Durant, the three-time bankrupted owner of General Motors. They hype up the price of a stock. They buy it in great quantities as insiders, and then they quickly sell without alerting the market, dumping the stock on the public, and all those poor schmoes like you and me who bought the stock while it was skyrocketing up are left with the losings. It's one thing for people to lose faith in an institution. Bernie! Bernie! What's up here? What? It's another to lose faith in a trusted individual. The Madoff scandal is a fundamental breach of trust. I had confidence in him personally. We had dinner together. Um, I'm on his foundation. I've given substantial dollars to that foundation. This man who was so beloved on Wall Street, it turned out to be a fraud. So many innocent people who really didn't deserve to be hurt, just people who trusted him. It's overwhelming. <laughs> It's more like a violation um, than anything else. I want his family to feel the pain that they've inflicted on our family. It's not the money. It's, it's, um, 
It's just being in the presence of such an evil person. If people can't trust where they're putting their money and investing, if people stop investing in our businesses and in our government, um, where does that leave us? Why were you getting rid of all the jewelry, Mr. Madoff? Why were you getting rid of the jewelry? When Bernie Madoff confessed to perpetrating the largest Ponzi in history, no one could quite believe it. If you were asking yourself, who's the least likely person to pull a con, it would be a Bernie Madoff. The art of the con is not new. Fraud has been around ever since people learned to tell lies. Ponzi schemes have probably been with us since civilization began. I mean, I can imagine there must have been some sharp-eyed Babylonian who was telling, you know, put your cattle in my corral and they'll have more calves than any other corral in town. American history generally is full of confidence games that resemble what Bernie Madoff was engaged in. All confidence games play on that deeply ingrained, very American desire to make a fast buck. The label confidence man was coined in 1849 to describe a huckster named William Thompson who pulled a scam simply by dressing up as a well-to-do financier. And he would go up to another well-dressed gentleman and he would pretend that he knew him and he would talk to him for a few minutes. And of course, when that happens, most people are embarrassed because they, they don't want to admit that they don't know the individual, so they make believe they know him. And then he says, will you do me a favor? Do you have the confidence to lend me your watch. And of course, the gentleman would lend him his watch and they would never see him again. The law eventually caught up with Thompson, but the nickname Confidence Man or Con Man stuck. The way the Confidence Man lures the mark in is by himself being a bit skeptical of the mark. He said, I'm not really sure that you have full confidence in me. You had to show how confident you were in Bernie before he allowed you in. America's biggest con man, Bernie Madoff, got his start in a middle-class Jewish neighborhood in Queens, New York, not far from the wide Rockaway beaches where he worked as a lifeguard during summer vacation. You're talking about a kid from Queens who goes to school at Hofstra, not at Harvard. Well, what you get with the Ponzi perps is they tend to be people who come from humble means. They were exposed to wealth, but not part of wealth. I don't belong here. I know the system, but I'm not of the system. And this enables uh, graft. The kind of people who defraud their own friends and, and relations and family are sociopaths who don't have a conscience. There isn't the same kind of internal mechanism that says, I'm doing something wrong. They're crooks from the start. Bernie started learning about Wall Street at an early age. His mother briefly operated a broker-dealer firm out of their home until she shut down rather than file the necessary paperwork. He grew up in a family that was already intimately knowledgeable about the workings of the stock market, uh, particularly those fringe areas of the stock market. The fringe areas of the market, over-the-counter stocks not traded on the big boards, were where Bernie got his start. You need the supposed profit-making venture. And so the smartest, the most effective crooks will actually have some kind of business. In 1960, 22-year-old Bernie founded his legitimate business, a trading firm called Madoff Securities. He claimed that he started the business with proceeds from his lifeguard job. In reality, the father of his new wife, Ruth, loaned them $50,000 to start the business. It was a tight-knit family firm, with Ruth helping out early on and Bernie's younger brother, Peter, joining soon after law school. His methods were very up-to-date, were very computerized, and uh, as a result of which he was considered to be sort of a, you know, a, a pioneer in electronic trading. We saw, meeting my brother and, and myself, uh, that there was an opportunity to bring automation into the over-the-counter marketplace and create some visibility, transparency in the marketplace. So we came up with the concept of developing a screen-based uh, trading mechanism, and that was the uh, start of NASDAQ. The world's first electronic stock market, NASDAQ, lists primarily high-tech companies not traded on other markets. 
In addition to the trading business, Madoff Securities had an investment arm where Bernie took people's money and invested it for them. The question investigators want answered is, was this investment arm ever legitimate? That is the most intriguing question about Bernie Madoff. Did he start out as an honest man or did he start out seeing this as a really clever ploy that he could use to his own benefit? The earliest investors were Bernie and Ruth's friends from school, from Catskills resorts, and from the Jewish country clubs the Madoffs belonged to once they moved from Queens to the North Shore of Long Island. Crooks like to start sort of in their own communities. It's the trust factor. He preyed a lot on other Jewish individuals to start his scheme. You're going to give someone who lives in your neighborhood and goes to the church you attend a little bit more trust than you're going to give someone else. Schemes like this often are what we call affinity schemes. They're people like you. In Ponzi's case, he was first most appealing to fellow Italian Americans. His community gathered around him and said, he's one of us. He will make us rich. In Madoff's case, I think we're seeing the same thing because we've seen how many Jewish philanthropies and individuals were affected by this. In the 1990s, Scientologists were duped by a member of their church, Reed Slatkin, whose success investing with internet service provider Earthlink gave him credibility. Slatkin kind of ingratiated himself to some of these people got them to trust him and got them to invest money with him. By the time Slatkin's Ponzi exploded, nearly $600 million had been lost. Just as Slatkin had been able to hide behind his legitimate success as an Earthlink investor, Madoff hid behind his apparently legitimate trading company. You have tremendous uh, efficiencies uh, by operating in a dealer system, particularly one that is uh, as automated as ours. On his way up, Bernie leveraged his apparent acumen to acquire powerful friends in high places. He served as non-executive chairman of the NASDAQ in 1990, 91, and 93. Because his business model was so innovative, he participated at round tables where he, his views were expressed. He came across as, quote, the voice of experience. He was like the grown-up in the room. Bernie became the go-to guy that regulators at the Securities and Exchange Commission turned to for advice. Whenever I go down to Washington and meet with the SEC and complain to them that the industry is either overregulated or the burdens are too great, they all start to roll their eyes. But they made the changes. Apparently, regulators and investors alike were all taken in by Madoff. Here's an individual that was always accepted by telephone. If you called him, you always received a, a, a telephone call in, in, in return. Uh, when my wife's uh, sister passed away, Bernie, Mad Bernie Madoff came to the funeral. That's the type of individual that we all thought he was, a very caring individual, when all he was was a first-class crook. As Madoff moved up in the world, joining the Upper East Side penthouse crowd, the Hampton set, and Palm Beach Society, his access to ever richer investors grew. Palm Beach is about as rich a community as you can find. And like a third of the membership of the Palm Beach Country Club uh, were victims of, of Bernard Madoff. The Madoffs bought their Palm Beach mansion in 1994 during the dot-com boom and a rising stock market. The economic climate absolutely played into Madoff's hands. People believed that the stock market could be counted on to go up and up and up. And even if it dipped a little bit, there were some smart guys, some smart people who were able to still beat the market. And if you were lucky enough to be with Bernie Madoff, you were in with one of the in guys. But even this new circle of wealthy marks wasn't enough to sustain the Madoff Ponzi. He needed access to the biggest money of all, hedge funds, institutional investors, and even charities. How did Bernie Madoff manage to pull off the biggest, longest-lasting Ponzi scheme in American history? Like many successful con artists, it seems he had his finger on the pulse of his investors. This is something that perpetrators are very good at. They in addition to sizing up their victims, they size up the tenor of the times. Madoff knew, for instance, that the crowd he targeted was devoted to charity, so he became involved in many of their favorite causes as both a generous donor and as an investment guru. Word spread along with his victim list. Anytime you're dealing with philanthropies, it gives you a certain legitimacy. 
In Madoff's case, it had the added effect of both being stability and legitimacy. What he did, which I think was sort of a, a, an evil genius, if you will, was to find investors who could be counted on not to withdraw their money. Charities fit this bill. They usually spend only about 5% of their monies, keeping the rest safely invested. This conservatism makes them a good mark for the scam artist, like John Bennett Jr., a businessman who in the late 80s and early 90s ran a phony entity called the Foundation for New Era Philanthropy in the Philadelphia area. New Era Philanthropy was able to tell its marks, we have found a benefactor who will double your money for you. People running nonprofits, they're as susceptible as anyone to hearing a good swindler come along who seems to have nonprofit bona fides and credentials and experience promising a way to bring those returns up a little bit. By the time Bennett was arrested in 1995, he had collected $135 million from charitable institutions and their contributors. Contributors. Of course, this total pales in comparison to the amount of money Bernie Madoff took from charities and foundations. But in the end, the biggest money in Madoff's scheme came through hedge funds. In the 2000s, the market boom was largely fueled by hedge funds, privately pooled investment funds for the wealthy. Here's this side of the investment world, which is explicitly designed to be unregulated and aggressive and corner cutting. What a great context for a swindler. And no swindler was in a better position to take advantage of the hedge fund economy than Madoff. He depended on his connections to the most powerful financial circles, a kind of global aristocracy of the super rich. That's who was invited to join Bernie Madoff's scheme. And what made it all possible, in my view, is that it depended on a kind of pervasive insiderism. Ponzi was an outsider. Madoff's an insider. And we have been running a financial economy in this country for the last 15 or 20 years, which has been premised on that kind of insiderism. I only need to mention Enron, Tyco, WorldCom, to remind people of how insiderish this financial economy has been. Madoff used his insider status to attract hedge fund money. But he also understood exactly what his clients were looking for. Hedge funds were doubling people's money. Hedge funds were turning back fantastic returns. People didn't trust them completely, though, and Madoff recognized what people wanted, which was metronomic returns, 12% a year, 1% a month. Madoff technically didn't run a hedge fund himself. Instead, he found fund managers who set up special investment pools for him, known as feeder funds. The feeder fund managers, like Ezra Merkin of Ascot Partners and Walter Knoll of Fairfield Greenwich Group, fed billions of dollars to Madoff. And in return, they earned hefty fees from the transactions, usually 20% of profits. Those fees were actually typical in the economic boom of the 2000s. You have that atmosphere of unreasoning, irrational expectations. People are really convinced that, that they've entered a new period of unending prosperity, and the confidence man enters that picture to take advantage of exactly that desire. Once again, the familiar cycle. The boom economy creates and camouflages the fraud. In the go-go 80s, a man named J. David Dominelli cooked up a scheme that played on one of the hot stock market careers of the decade. He pretended to be a ruthless and effective currency trader. And really, he was just operating a Ponzi scheme. He was attracting high net worth people to come into his offices in La Jolla, California. They would give him investment capital, and he would use it supposedly in these sort of indecipherably complicated currency hedging arbitrage transactions that he was running, but it was all a sham. It took years before defrauded investors who lost about $80 million forced Dominelli's hand. But Bernie Madoff's hand remained firmly on the wheel of his empire for decades, in part because so many investors had no idea that he had their money. They thought their money was with the fund that they had invested in, in some cases even apparently in a bank that was used as a repository. And they had no idea where the end result was. One of the feeder funds caught Stephen Greenspan's eye in 2007. The close family member was telling me about this investment she was doing with this fund called Rye. And I looked at the paperwork and their history, and it was incredible. Get the same 1% a month, regardless of what the stock market was doing. That's really what I was looking for. 
In the wake of Madoff's collapse, many have asked how much the feeder fund managers knew or guessed about his operation. I contend that many of them were basically turning a blind eye to their doubts in order to collect the beautiful fees that were generated from these feeder funds. A lot of the people involved with the feeder funds had virtually their entire worth tied up in those funds. Why on earth, if they suspected uh, a scam, would they have uh, put not only their own money, their family money, their firm's money, their children's money into these investments? Whatever they thought about the investment, these feeder fund salesmen fed made off enough money to create the biggest Ponzi scheme in history. But still, he needed more. Madoff started pressuring the funds to enlist new capital across the globe. This past year, before his arrest, you saw a much more frenetic pace of money raising as he moved past Europe into Asia and on into China. When the demands of the scheme get greater, you are going to branch out. And certainly in Madoff's case, the modern era, it becomes global. But even as Madoff reaped the rewards of the global economy, a few competitors began questioning what he was doing and taking those doubts to the U.S. government. The biggest changes in the wake of the Bernie Madoff scandal will be at the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. How could the federal regulatory agency have failed to notice the biggest fraud in the history of Wall Street? That's part of this really fascinating story, is how could the SEC have dropped the ball so often? The SEC continues to roar like a mouse and bite like a flea. The SEC received repeated warnings about Madoff from a very determined whistleblower. In 1999, Boston investment manager Frank Casey met with some Madoff investors who told him about the steady returns they were getting. A skeptical Casey brought the information back to one of his associates, a math guy named Harry Markopoulos. And I said, well, Harry, this guy's producing these beautiful return streams of 1% a month. I mean, why can't you do this? And Harry said, this is a fraud. And then four hours later, he says, this is a Ponzi scheme. And I said, no, Ponzi's a strong word. In order to prove his point, Markopoulos ran mathematical models to try to reproduce Madoff's earnings. Harry Markopoulos is an intense and very smart guy. He understands the world of derivatives, the world of options. He could not recreate Madoff's performance. Now, you have to remember back in um, 2000, the largest hedge fund managers might be running two billion. Here was Madoff running seven to 10 billion. The scale of it, if it was a fraud, was almost beyond belief. So Markopoulos turned to the Securities and Exchange Commission, formed in 1933 to police Wall Street. There must be a strict supervision of all banking and credit and investment. The SEC was formed in the early 1930s in the aftermath of the stock market crash to restore investor confidence. Rightly or wrongly, looking to place blame for the Great Depression, many Americans pointed their fingers at Wall Street. And for a long time, nobody wants to go near Wall Street. It takes till 1954 before the Dow Jones Industrial Average is again what it was in 1929. And it wasn't until the 1980s that Wall Street regained its central place in the American culture. After that, for 25 years, the market went up and up, and Americans clamored to get in on the action. The SEC, meanwhile, has struggled to keep up. Wall Street and other powerful political interests like it that the SEC is under-resourced, spread too thin. They're there, but maybe not able to do the digging, uh, which means you can hide things. Harry Markopoulos kept trying to convince the agency to dig deeper into Bernie Madoff's investment business. Unfortunately, as they didn't respond to my written submissions in 2000, 2001, 2005, 2007, and 2008, here we are today. He made repeated attempts to interest regulators in what he saw as the transparent flaws in the Madoff story. It, 
couldn't work. It clearly has been going on too long. Nobody can get those kind of consistent returns in up markets and down markets. Look at this little bitty accounting firm he uses. On and on, a dozen, two dozen red flags that he pointed out to regulators. In 2005, an SEC enforcement team finally met with Markopoulos. He laid out two possible scenarios to explain Madoff's performance. One was that he was running a Ponzi scheme. The other was that he was front-running, a form of insider trading. Front-running is having inside information in advance of where a stock is moving uh, just by your position uh, in the industry. Inside information that's not publicly available so you can get out ahead of whichever way a stock is moving. You may remember Michael Milken, the big Wall Street guy from the 80s. One of the things that the feds finally got him on was front running. Milken's wasn't the first such case. Some of the worst offenses in the pre-SEC days of Wall Street were very similar. They have specialists who are market makers on the floor of the exchange. They know that if a price gets to a certain point, this is going to happen. Well, what they would do is they would tell their friends. And so the friends would then manipulate the price. They'd sell stock back and forth to each other to get the price up because they knew what was going to happen. Then they'd cut and run, and it was virtually guaranteed profit. And it was just, you know, classic insider trading. Bernie Madoff's business placing trades for large customers was exactly the same as the old Wall Street specialists, meaning he was in a perfect position to know what was going to happen in the market. People thought that Bernie Madoff knew where the market was heading because he was sort of controlling the market to a certain extent, and they could get in on that. They could get in on this front running. I'm going to put my money with Madoff because he's, you know, he's on the inside. He can get some of that action. The SEC did investigate the front-running charge, but gave Madoff a clean bill of health in 2006. Why, having eliminated front-running, didn't they come back to Markopoulos' basic point, which is, if it's not that way, and there's no legitimate way he could be making these returns, this must be a Ponzi scheme. The possibility that he was just an out-and-out -out fraud, apparently, is something that they dismissed out of hand. They just simply didn't believe that such a thing was possible. After all, Madoff sat on SEC committees, and his family members served on other regulatory panels. Did those connections play a role? Clearly, the SEC was afraid of Mr. Madoff. I gift-wrapped and delivered the largest Ponzi scheme in history to them, and somehow, they couldn't be bothered to conduct a thorough and proper investigation. What? any organization does, when they just don't have the resources to do their job right, you make very rough cut judgments. Does this look like a real fraud? If you rationalize, no, not Bernie Madoff. You move on to your next task. The lack of resources at the SEC was part of a broad push to deregulate Wall Street over the last decade. The SEC was never important to the Clinton administration. And then when the Bush administration came in, a distinctive change in priorities occurred. The SEC's priorities were to make sure that the United States stayed competitive in an increasingly fast-paced global financial marketplace. Inevitably, that pushed other priorities aside. That change in priorities made way for a host of problems on Wall Street. I think the sincere belief that deregulation was the way to go, that it would ensure economic growth, made it convincing to people that you shouldn't mess with people like Bernie Madoff. They know what they're doing, and excessive regulation will get in their way. Now, everybody's a regulator. You couldn't find somebody with a pulse who wouldn't say today, we have to do something to regulate these people. They're bandits, they're out of control. You have to regulate. The fact that the SEC missed not only Madoff, but the banking irregularities that brought down the markets in 2008 has only fed the anger. One guy with a few friends and helpers discovered this thing nearly a decade ago led you to this pile of dung that is, that is Bernie Madoff and stuck your nose in it, and you couldn't figure it out. Obviously, in the case of Bernie Madoff, red flags were raised years before this scheme came apart. Nobody paid any attention. Uh, that's part of the euphoria of the moment. Oh, no problem. We're just in this boom time, and it's going to go on forever. But the boom time, which Bernie Madoff had ridden for years, would come to an end, pulling Madoff and his victims down with it.
If American financial history is a story of the frauds that come with every boom cycle, why do people keep getting duped? The answer may be that in the euphoria, they stop listening to reason. We are in some new world. There's always talk of a new world. The old laws don't apply is always the siren song. And when that new world collapses, they are shocked once more. We have a long way to go, but we are on the way. I regret to say that we're in the worst economic mess since the Great Depression. We start 2009 in the midst of a crisis unlike any we have seen in our lifetime. We have had panics on Wall Street roughly every 20 years, ever since the beginning of Wall Street in the 1790s. And that's roughly one generation. And that's how long it takes for people to forget the lessons of the past. And so suddenly everybody who comes to Wall Street is going to get rich. And, you know, it seems like it for a while, and then the excesses pile up, and then finally it collapses, and it starts over again. It was the market collapse of 2008 that brought down Bernie Madoff. It was a classic panic, although it wasn't a one-day panic. It took, like, you know, two months to play out. But still, it was brutal. Madoff, who had ridden so many economic cycles, had weathered panics before, in the 1980s, and after the dot-com bubble burst. But the panic of 2008 was especially dangerous, because now he had taken billions of dollars from hedge funds. If you're an institutional investor, and you've lived through these past 18 months, by December, you're saying, well, thank goodness I've still got my money with Bernie. You don't want to realize losses on your other investments. You want to, you know, go back to reliable Bernie to get your money. When he couldn't repay those investors, reliable Bernie knew he couldn't keep it going anymore. He decided to confess. Now, as authorities try to piece together what Madoff did, they are most interested in whether he acted alone. The head of his accounting firm, David Freeling, has already been charged with securities fraud. But suspicion falls most heavily on members of the Madoff family. I find it very hard to believe that none of his family knew anything about it. For one thing, just before the whole thing broke, Mrs. Madoff withdrew $15.5 million on two occasions, one the day before he fessed up to his sons. Other family members worked at the Madoff firm. Some of them lost money in the Ponzi. At a family level, it's a fascinating story, almost Shakespearean in some of the dynamics that must have gone on. As officials tried to unravel what the Madoffs knew and when they knew it, other families were suffering as well. My family has lost millions with Bernie Madoff. My stepmother, my two stepbrothers, daughters, the end of her college fund. The bold-faced names on the victims list and the immense amounts of money lost have fed an almost morbid fascination. We're used to stories about the poor people who have been, you know, devastated by different financial problems. Well, this is a case where the tornado skipped the, the trailer park and wiped out the houses on the hill. The next round of this drama is a matter for the courts. There are early investors who made money from the scheme, which they may be forced to repay. It's almost like a financial world's version of Lord of the Flies, and it's going to pit a victim against victim. The losses have been devastating for so many people, but the most wrenching story so far is that of a man who staked everything on Madoff. Terry de la Villache, who managed one of the feeder funds called Access International, committed suicide less than two weeks after Madoff was arrested. Not only was he a French nobleman, he was a noble man. He was an honorable man. Nearly a decade ago, Frank Casey raised with Villoche the possibility that Bernie Madoff was running a scam. He told me, if this guy is a fraud, I'm in serious trouble. He said, I've got all my money in it. I've got most of my family money in it. I have every business connection and private wealth management and banking throughout Europe that I've developed my whole life in it. I believe in it. I believe in Bernie. In the case of Villoche, this was an extremely proud individual who was so horrified that he was involved in Madoff and caused all of these losses for people that uh, he took responsibility in, in the ultimate and uh, quite hideous way by uh, 
slitting his wrists. Bernie Madoff's crimes have cast a long shadow. I've never seen anything like this. I've never read about anything like this. Nothing on this scale, nothing that swept so far around the world, nothing that lasted so long, nothing that brought in so many sophisticated investors. This is not just some engineered financial product that collapsed. This thing wiped out people. The scandal has destroyed America's confidence in the masters of the universe. Bernie Madoff was a hero of our time, the way a lot of our great uh, financial heroes once were. And then came the day of reckoning. Bringing Bernie Madoff down from a hero to the nation's greatest villain.